markets as well. One of the things that investors do seem to be very focused on, I mean, you've been very engaged in deal making in the past year or so. Are you going to continue with that? Yeah, it's a very active marketplace in gaming right now for mergers and acquisitions. It's now a global talent base uh, for the making of games. Uh, in fact, our last two acquisitions were in Turkey and Finland, uh, respectively. Um, so we see a real opportunity in the global marketplace to add to the growth that our company is already experiencing uh, by finding teams and, and franchises that we could add to Zynga that would further accentuate our great growth. There seems to be more competition coming into the marketplace. I mean, Apple Arcade launching last month. You've got these services from uh, the likes of Microsoft and Google. Do you see that as a challenge? I, I don't. I think that there's more than enough room uh, for everybody here to find great market positions. Uh, you know, overall games this year are going to be, it's about $152 billion business. There's two and a half billion to three billion gamers worldwide. There's a lot of different very successful business models. There's a lot of very successful different types of platforms from phones to consoles to PCs. Um, so I think there's a, more than enough to go around. Uh, in terms of our business, um, this has been a record year for us. In fact, um, this will be the highest uh, revenue uh, year that the company has ever seen since we IPO'd. And we're growing the business aggressively, not only through our acquisitions, but also through um, the, the franchises that have been around for 10 or 15 years, like Zynga Poker and Words with Friends. So uh, we welcome competition and we like to see innovation. And so a lot of different offerings is good for gamers and I think it's good for the industry. Hey, Frank, we spent a lot of time talking about 5G next year uh, as it applies to gaming. I mean, are there any games in which latency, the changes in latency would help you or would that inspire you to create maybe different kinds of concepts of games? Oh, 5G is going to be awesome for gaming. If you look at the history of the industry over the last 25 years, any time game developers got more bandwidth, more processing power, um, they create all new experiences. I mean, if you look at what uh, you can do with location-based gaming now, the massively multiplayer games that you see like PUBG and Fortnite exploding all over the world. So as phones become even more capable and are able to bring more and more people together at very high performance levels, uh, you're going to see an incredible growth driver uh, enter into mobile gaming that I believe will carry us for several years. No, I, I understand that, but I'm just trying to understand whether it would change the experience of Words with Friends. Probably not a game like Words with Friends, but if you look at our racing game, CSR Racing, which is a very high-end uh, game where you're ra racing uh, Ferraris and Porsches, uh, we'll be able to make those games very high performance. The graphics will get better. You'll be able to play with more people. The latency of the multiplayer will go down. Uh, you'll be able to download the games straight from the app. You won't necessarily have to go to the app store to get the game. Um, so the combination of streaming and 5G capabilities will really open up new ways to distribute the games and will make them far more high performance for players. Frank, based on what you've seen so far, are you any closer to deciding how you play in services like Apple Arcade, a, a bit higher end perhaps from a uh, development necessary perspective, uh, but the revenue model may be still unclear. Yeah, I think if you look at the games that are actually offered in Apple Arcade, um, they're not that different than what we're doing in free to play. If you look at Fortnite, PUBG, Call of Duty, our games like Zynga Poker and Words with Friends, Candy Crush, those are all very high-end ga games, very high performance, and they're all free to play. Um, and they reach very global audiences. They reach Android audiences and Apple audiences. Within Apple Arcade, you have smaller development teams making more single-player oriented games for now, and they're, they're distinctly different offerings. So I think both can find success. What we're learning from the subscription model, though, is that there are these things called battle passes or game passes that allow players to sign up to a game for a set period of time, for several months, where a lot of the value and the features and the things they get for a small fee, um, we're finding that to be a very popular way to engage with games from a monetization standpoint. Frank, uh, recently CNBC did an investigation about the rising threats and, and financial risks of hacking within the video gaming industry. It was a little more focused on esports, but in general, how big of a risk is security uh, and hacking to Zynga? Well, look, I think games in general, are they're, it's a digital business, and we live in a world where cyber attacks happen on, on digital companies. Uh, recently, Zynga did experience a hacking incident uh, with our games. Um, fortunately, we were able to detect it very early on and contain it. Uh, and the information that we gather from players 
doesn't really reach to the level of social security or, or financial data. So for the most part, uh, we lost a little bit of uh, email traffic and email uh, IDs for some of our franchises. But fortunately, we were able to notify uh, the players, uh, let the, the regulatory uh, arms know, uh, and then the investigation continues. So we're, we're pleased with our response and we take our player security very seriously. But this is just kind of a fact of life that if you run a digital business, um, there are hackers out there that will try and uh, go after you.